What's going on YouTube? This is ATI Markets. ATI stands for Alternative Thinking Investing. This is your first stop in stock market needs, crypto needs, and all other forms of life. And here I am today to talk to you about a very important topic, especially in the face of 2020 and 2021 market volatility. And I'm here to tell you that this is the only stock market video you're ever going to need. I'm going to cover a lot of topics today, but what I'm going to do is ensure that you walk away from this video understanding how to invest, what you need to do to invest for long-term success, and how to ignore the market volatility, the market news, and all the other crap that life throws at you. So before I get started, and before I really jump into this well-articulated video, I want to just ask you to generously tap the like button below and if you like this material go ahead and hit subscribe it helps the channel out a lot and it means a lot to me personally and I can say that these past few weeks in 2021 today it's March 19th 2021 have been pretty tough on a lot of people and a lot of investors and have left a lot of people confused so we're gonna talk about everything including long-term investing, compounded annual growth. We're going to talk about inflation. We're going to talk about the Federal Reserve. And then we're going to just talk about what you should do and how to just take a step away from the craziness and how to invest for long-term success. So with that said, thank you so much for joining me. And let's jump into it. Let's go, YouTube. All right, all right, all right. So we're going to jump right into it. And I'm going to start off with my favorite tool for analyzing markets. And I'm going to tell you why I do this by the numbers and why I like to take a quantitative approach to long-term investing. So this first segment of the video is about long-term investing by the numbers. The second segment of the video, I'm going to cover what the Federal Reserve does and what their current approach is and what that means for the next couple years and beyond. After that, I'm gonna cover inflation and GDP and why some of the concerns may or may not be overblown in the market today as we see yields spike up on the treasury. So with that said, more importantly, how do you invest long term? So what is this tool? So this is PortfolioVisualizer.com. It's a mathematical quantitative tool. But don't get scared on those big words because they don't really mean that much. At the end of the day, you could be a 5-year-old or a 50-year-old or a 90-year-old and you can understand this data. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. So first thing I'm going to do is click back test portfolio and I'm going to provide a link below in the description. This is completely free. I'm not getting paid by this site. This is just free information that was created by a very intelligent mathemat mathematician and I just think that it's an amazing tool. So here you have back test portfolio asset allocation and a few of you are probably going to look at this and be like, what am I looking at? And how do I interpret this? And this looks kind of scary. Like, what does all this mean? Time period? What, what is the difference? So what I like to think about in this tool is I like to take a snapshot in time and I like to look at certain ETFs. It's the simplest way to see market performance over time. In this case, this tool actually currently only goes back to 1985. So you get about almost 40 years of history of data, which I think is pretty adequate for making long-term decisions. Buffett typically likes to see 10 years of results before he chooses an investment. Other major gurus are a little bit different, but let's just take a look. So for this first analysis, I chose 1985, which is the oldest date, to 2021, and I just keep it standard. So I'm not changing anything else here, even though I can. I can rebalance, I can add other investments, I can compound it with in uh, you know additional investments and deposits over time. So let's just keep it simple. Let's just put ten thousand dollars, ten thousand, and I'm going to put it into the spy, which is the S and P five hundred. As most of you know, the S and P five hundred has been the barometer of long term investing for the past hundred years. I'm going to put Apple because it's one of the most popular investments, and I'm going to put Amazon. It's also one of the most popular investments. Portfolio one is going to be 100%, portfolio two 100%, portfolio three 100%. What I'm doing is I'm 
analyzing these each in a vacuum. 100%, 100%, 100%. Let's go, analyze portfolios, bam! So now, as you can see, I have three pies, 100, 100, 100. Spy, Apple, Amazon. Since 1985, the S&P 500 has earned an average of 8% a year. That's pretty good. Apple has earned just under 36% a year. Pretty fucking amazing, if you ask me. And then Amazon, just under 32%. Also really amazing. If you had invested in Apple this early, your money would be worth $12 million. As opposed to the S&P 500, your $10,000 would have grown to a meager 59000 This shows you how incredible compounding growth has been for Apple and Amazon over time. But what it doesn't show you is how well they performed over the past few years, which may be more important in some regards because a lot of the growth happened before 2000 and 2008 and then 2015. A lot of growth happened right here but during the tech boom. Let's see what happened the past five years. So now, actually, I'm going to narrow this down even closer. Let's do the past three years and compare these three same portfolios. Let's do analyze portfolios the same way, except the only thing different is 2018. Bam! Three pies. Still, really impressive results from Apple. I got only 14%, which is not bad, over the past three years from the S&P. I got 41% from Apple and 36% from Amazon. That means my $10,000 th three years ago from Apple is worth 29,000 or 26,000 Amazon. Clearly higher than the 15,000 the S&P 500 would have given you. As you can see, Apple and Amazon have clearly outperformed and done so in a much better way than the S&P 500. So even though the S&P 500 is conservative by most, it actually has underperformed these major investments. So what is your key takeaway here? Either way, you know that your long-term returns in the S&P 500 are 8% a year. That means you don't buy and sell every time the market goes up and down and up and down and up and down. What that tells you is you wanna leave the money in there to grow long-term. If you're a long-term investor, you don't care about the daily fluctuations in the market and it ultimately does not matter to you. You need to be concerned about the bigger picture. Otherwise, you're never going to get to here or here. You're never going to get to these points and you're never going to get out of these first, sometimes these first five years of your investment may be the most volatile. And that's what's so important. Now I'm going to rebalance and just add to the investment. And let's see what happens if I add to the investment. I'm going to contribute a fixed amount I'm going to do $100 and I'm going to change the contribution frequency to monthly. So $100 is a pretty small amount, but let's see what it does to the returns. So we had 8%, 36%, and 32%. And it's going to make those returns go higher because you're adding to the money over time. It's called dollar cost averaging. Now check it out. So my 8% on S&P 500 actually boosted me to about 13.3%. By adding $100 to the S&P 500 every month, I went from just having 60K over this period of time to having 181K. Huge difference. With Apple, the returns were already so strong that it wasn't as much of a difference, but I went from having a $12 million final balance to about a $16 million. And in Amazon, I have an $8 million. So as you can see, contribution to your investment and dollar cost averaging is power. Let's do the same thing over the past three years and look at the return. So I'm at 14%, 41, and 36. Now I'm gonna do the same thing with just a simple $100. How many of you can get together $100 and make it work? I think a lot of you. Let's go ahead and do that. Fixed amount. $100 monthly. I think a lot of you can come up with that money. Let's go. Analyze portfolios. Bam! As you can see, three pies still. Wow. So I went from 13.86% with S&P 500 to 25%. I went from in the 30s for both Amazon and Apple to 52 and 45% respectively. 
I earned basically an extra $8,000 for each investment. Pretty damn good just by just putting $100 a month over the past 36 months. Pretty damn cool. Now, if you want me to drive this point a little further, take a look at the S&P 500. Here at Macro Trends, they show you the returns over a period in time. And a statistician can look at this right now and just tell you that this is basically a wide distribution of returns and you do have some really bad years underperforming. But dollar, does dollar cost averaging work? Let's take a look at the spreadsheet. I actually exported this into Excel and let's take a look at the average returns from, this is a period of 1927 to 2021. So look, I'm going back how many how many years is this this is a lot this is 94 years that's pretty sick now I can basically average these out and see so I'm just gonna go to the bottom here and I'm just gonna do a simple average nothing fancy you don't need to be fancy to to get good numbers and analyze I have a 94 year average in the S&P 500 of just under 8% check that out This is already in percent, 7.73%. Pretty sick, pretty good information. So with that said, as you can see, the S&P 500 has incredible compounding effect. Now that we've talked about long-term returns and how to wrap your head around it, I think we're gonna talk about something a little bit deeper. So for those of you that are economic focused people, you're gonna find this really interesting. But for those of you that hear the term Federal Reserve, money printing, inflation, GDP, this is what you really wanna stay tuned for because I'm gonna help you wrap your head around it in a very easy, basic way. So first of all, the Federal Reserve is essentially what is supposed to be managing monetary policy in the United States of America. What they can do through open market operations is they can essentially buy debt. Debt is created by the US government, usually on the treasury side, or debt is created by various corporate institutions via mortgages and other types of things that you know, influence various lending activities. So a lot of times debt is packaged into assets like a mortgage backed security, which is an asset that pays a yield or dividend. Some of you might have heard about this from The Big Short, a very famous movie. Now, mortgage backed securities essentially are large pools of debt that reflect home ownership. The Federal Reserve can basically buy multiple types of assets. And here you see just the credit and liquidity balance sheet metric of the Federal Reserve. And you can see a major uptick in 2020. So in 2019, we went from just under 3.8 trillion to now approaching 7.7 trillion. So we basically went up by more than double which is pretty alarming in some senses of the word, and in other senses of the word, it's not. But what that means is the Federal Reserve basically bought a ton of debt in the market to basically absorb the shock of the coronavirus pandemic. And the coronavirus pandemic had a shock on economic out activity and also various institutions and the US government, anyone that owned debt was now scared. The Federal Reserve basically absorbed the shock by buying that debt. And how they buy that debt is essentially they're using digital activity to just go ahead and purchase debt. So it is in a form money printing because the money did not exist before and now it exists afterwards. And I'm gonna do a separate video on really covering how this all works under the Federal Reserve umbrella, but let's just, let's not get too far off base. I found this really interesting video that says, or article that says around 20% of US dollars were created this year. And there's another metric that Federal Reserve uses to measure the stock of actual physical dollars known as M2. And that rose from 15 trillion 
to about just under 19 trillion. And this all happened in 2020. So that means that the supply of money went from, you know, went up by almost $3 trillion, which is basically one in five dollars in 2020. So what that means is the supply of money actually did go up through various means. Obviously, we had stimulus, which provided dollars to various individuals. Employment was shocked to individuals, but unemployment was paid out and pandemic employment was also paid out. So many individuals actually that were in lower earning jobs actually ended up earning just as much or more than what they were earning pre-pandemic. So now you have a ton of people with more money than they used to, and you also have a stimulus check that equates to more money also. You now have trillions of dollars that were actually transferred to the average American, and then you also had trillions of dollars that absorbed the debt to basically facilitate corporations to be more active in the market. So let's not get too far off base, but basically there's more money floating out there. Here we have the summary of economic projections from, from the Federal Reserve. And here we have what we've been talking about on the news lately in 2021. And one of the concerns is inflation. So Federal Reserve actually uses PCE inflation, which I'll cover later on in this video. But long story short, the GDP is actually really, really a major uptick in 2021. We're, we're going to have almost six plus percent growth. So it is a little weird that you look at the inflation number and it's they're saying it's only 2.2 percent. Now, there's been some inflationary pressures, that's for sure. And there's two major institutions that actually measure inflation for the government separately from the Federal Reserve. And I'm going to get into that in a moment, but let's continue. So basically, we have a high growth economy this year. We have what the Federal Reserve is claiming low inflation. So that helps justify them to keep their rates low. They have a target of 2%, but they've loosely uh, used that target. They're really focused on unemployment. And here you can see the unemployment rate is still uh, is still high, and they're, they're targeting a lower unemployment rate. But the unemployment rate, I mean, 2021, is you know four to five percent now that's much lower than where we thought we would be we're doing much better than we thought we would be basically here's the projected inflation from statista which also says 2.24 percent i just want to show that as a proxy and oecd this is the worldwide inflation rate and i think this is a good proxy because it shows worldwide inflation data as 1.78%. That means that things are going to get 1.78% more expensive for the entire world in this next year. But for the European area, it's actually under a percent. So Europe is really having low growth and they're having a difficulty in sparking that growth. Kiplinger re recently pushed this article out there that gasoline prices have moved up 6.6% in February of 2021. And the surge in gasoline prices is getting out of hand. And I think this is interesting because overall, we're still being told that inflation is relatively low. Here's the GDP forecast for the world. Now, we're basically having a very strong couple years here, as you can see. We're going from 2021. Here you can see the value is 99.6. And then you're moving 2022, the value goes to 106. So that's a pretty big increase. We're talking almost a 6 to 7% increase of GDP. That's real gross domestic product. Basically, we're being somehow we're being 7% more productive in some form or another. And that can get into various measurements of how GDP is measured. But still, we're being more productive somehow. Now I'm going to talk about inflation for this last segment of the video. So I hope I didn't lose you, but here we're going to talk about PCE inflation. And I'm going to try to keep this really brief for you because I know you're tired and I know you want to get back to just talking about general investing. But PCE inflation means personal consumption expenditures price index. And before we go crazy with what that is, basically it's a measurement in how much stuff gets more expensive, household goods and services. Now the Bureau of Labor Statistics, a different agency, 
actually measures it a different way. But the Bureau of Economic Analysis, so there's two main bureaus that measure this stuff. There's Bureau of Economic Analysis, BA, and then there's BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics. The BLS is really mostly to help the Labor Department. That's the difference. But I like the BLS data more because I don't trust the Fed's data completely. Long story short, the Fed prefers using this than other measures. And my guess is that this form of data might have more potential influence in the agenda of the Federal Reserve. I can't say that for sure, but that's just my feeling on the situation. As far as quantitative, they're doing what they're saying they're doing and they, you know, they outline it for you and it's fairly transparent. CPI versus PCE. This is what I was just talking about, contrasting them. So CPI is actually the consumer price index from the BLS and personal consumption is from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Each of these is constructed for different groups of goods and services, most notably a headline. So basically you have different stuff being measured in different indexes. This is where this stuff gets a little convoluted. So you have one person, basically, let me contrast this. You have Joe selling you a certain price of good on the store down the street. Then you have Tim selling you a different price of good in a different location, and it's a different price based on other various factors. So when you get really into this, you can see that it's not a black and white situation. However, taking a step back, you can see that it's a little confusing when you say different agencies measuring different things. Why don't they combine and do an overall? That's a whole different question. So long story short, they're actually saying that um, this is the BEA that I just talked about that the Federal Reserve basically uses. So we basically have a 2.4% uh, you know, overall jump in personal consumption expenditures, current dollars. And then price index, the PCE, has only, according to them, moved up 1.5%. But this is actually a change month over month. So that means it's been moving up pretty rapidly, as you can see. When you see this happening and you have a 1% change each month, that actually equates to more than you would think. So it is a little bit alarming. Here's the BLS that I just mentioned. They're telling me that gas service went up 6.7% over the past 12 months, that food away from home went up 3.7% over the past 12 months, food at home 3.6%, 9.3% jump for used cars, a 1.2% jump for new vehicles, Medical care actually went down by 2.5%. Transportation services went down by 4.4%. Medical care went up by 3% here. So medical care commodities went down and medical care services went up. So that's the contrast there. So a lot of this stuff is really interesting and it, it basically makes us question, what are we really doing here? So we have a $9 trillion story of still saying that about one fifth of money has been printed in 2020. But Let's get, let's get down to the nitty gritty now and let's just think about things and let's just think about life for a second and think about what we're trying to do. So we don't know whether inflation is going to go up in the next two years, five years, three years, 10 years, or whenever. It's happened before and we just don't know. But it's going to happen at some point and we're likely seeing it already in real estate, in various commodities in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And I think those are all a, an extension of where the market's going. And I think what you're going to see over the next one to two years from 2021 is you're going to see a rotation into stocks that can benefit from a higher growth economy. Stuff like Home Depot, stuff like, you know, Microsoft will probably still be a good stock, but you're going to really see a rotation back into companies like the Home Depots, the Lowe's, you know, the... Uh, the crafts, the the Campbells, the you know the blue chip names, the WalMarts. You'll you'll see stuff like that going on. People will start shopping and spending money again. They'll probably they'll probably start traveling at the end of the year again. So you might see some travel stocks go up. You might see airline stocks rebound at the end of the year. You might even see people going on cruises at the end of the year. 
I'm not really, you know, into that. You might see people go to restaurants more. So you might see some of those go up like Darden and stuff like that. You might see some of the REITs start to rebound towards the end of the year. I think that there's absolutely a chance that mall stocks and mall uh, REITs might start going up like SPG and MAC. I think you'll start seeing stuff like that. But long story short, we don't know what the future holds. And as I showed you in the beginning of the video, you can effect to achieve long-term growth by making a simple strategy and that means you need to select high quality index funds and high quality blue chip names like apple that have proven themselves over time and that's just my final thought here and i think that you just you just keep buying at the end of the day and you just need to maintain employment or maintain cash flow and continue purchasing and that's the most important thing through any kind of market volatility and as far as real estate as far as bonds there is a chance that those prices do come down if yields go up in the next you know, year to two years. And obviously that would put downward pressure on stocks too. It might put upward pressure on cryptocurrency. Nobody really knows. I think that's the black box in the equation. I wouldn't be surprised if you see Bitcoin go towards 100,000. But with that said, I want to thank you for joining me. I think that you have the tools that you need to really think about long-term investing. You need to make a strategy that's simple and easy to understand. And most importantly, well diversified either amongst very strong names that have a proven long-term track record or the S&P 500, which has, like I said, a 100-year track record of 8%. Keep it simple. Stay smart. Ignore the BS and just keep buying and keep adding to it. Don't worry about buying and selling every time the market goes up. And with that said, happy trading, happy investment. I wish you all the best of success in your life, in your health, and your wellness. Take care. This is ATI Markets, Alternative Thinking Investing. If you want to get involved with me and join my Discord, send me an email, atimarkets1 at gmail.com. Reach out to me. Let me know. I'm involved in a lot of different activities right now, so I'm going to try to post more often. Thank you for joining me, and take care. Good night, everybody.